It's Song Talk Radio with Michael, Neil, Phil, and the gang. Hey, thanks for joining us uh, for another episode of the song of the show that talks about songwriting and the way people talk about sports or the way people talk about sports. We do this once a week, every week pretty well uh, for a long time. I'm your host, uh, Phil Emery, and with me are Mr. Michael Proudfoot. How are you doing, Michael? I'm doing quite well, thank you. All things considered, I think this is the only sunny day we're getting this week. So Mm. I was out cycling around, enjoying it. Had a massage because I did something to my neck, and I feel like a whole new person. <laughs> and who would that be? I haven't met him yet. <laughs> <laughs> so it remains to be discovered. And, of course, uh, Neil Modia. What's up with you, Neil? Oh, not very much. Just thinking about how um, how we report the scores on a show about songwriting, like a sports show. Yeah, there's no <laughs> winners and losers per se, right? <laughs> and that's Drake 14, the weekend 23. <laughs> oh, poor Drake. <laughs> Never gets a break. <laughs> well, he had oh, some, he had some he injuries okay. early on in the season. <laughs> so, right. uh, you know, and, um, you know, the offense isn't quite as what it used to be. But don't forget out there, uh, we want to hear from you. So send us an email at feedback at songtalk.ca. With the questions, suggestions, or comments on anything you hear on the show, and if you're watching us on YouTube, uh, why don't you click on that subscribe button, which is probably down there somewhere, and um, that would help, or send us a, leave a message on the YouTube uh, channel, that would be awesome as well. Uh, Later on, we will be talking about NFTs and just what what they are all about. But first, uh, Neil, we had our monthly song talk meeting yesterday. How did it go? Yeah, the, the meetup was really great. Um, we had um, mostly familiar faces, a few new faces, probably about um, we close to 20 people at the peak. <laughs> people started dropping off <laughs> after, you know, after a while. Um, but yeah, it was it was really great. We had some really great discussions about um, about, the, about the sort of creative process. And there, there was one member who actually brought um, lyrics but the lyrics she had written were based upon this enormous project that she has going, which is like a, literally writing a novel. And it was like this really elaborate science fiction story. And, um, and, and we, and the rest of us in the group were encouraging her to try and collaborate because being a lyricist, you, you know, you need a musician to work with um, to, you know, actually get a song out. And, um, and she was very worried, not worried, but she was more adamant that she wanted to have like the novel done and the story completely written before, you know, venturing out and trying to, you know, uh, do do something uh, musical with it, and 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 it reminded me of this um, this article that I'd read and this video that I'd seen a couple of weeks ago. Um, it was one of the doctors from the uh, World Health Organization who was talking about. Um, government inaction <laughs> with regard to COVID nineteen, and I, and and I pulled out this quote from it because it was really. It, it kind of spoke to a uh, creative endeavor as well. Um, so I'll just, I'll just read it here. The doctor had said, if you need to be right before you move, you will never win. Perfection is the enemy of good. Speed trumps, trumps perfection. And the problem in societies we have at, at this moment is everyone is afraid of making a mistake. Everyone is afraid of the consequence of error. But the greatest error is not to move. The greatest error is to be paralyzed by the fear of failure. And I thought that was really kind of poignant and, 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 to, the, and to the point about sort of um, always moving and always trying to learn something and always trying to produce something and, and, and do something actionable. And, and I said to her, like, if you, you know, if it, it's a fine thing if you want to finish your novel first, but if you wait until all those ducks are in a row, you might miss some opportunities for some really fine failures. Because <laughs> as, you, as you try to do it as a more iterative process of kind of bouncing back and forth between the novel and putting some of it to song, and then maybe that affects how you write the novel and back and forth, it might be a kind of cool synergy kind of thing. So it, it was an interesting conversation just about about uh, about the, the whole idea of creative process and, and what it takes to, to kind of keep the engine rolling. And, you know, and we've, we've spoken to songwriters on the show before who have... Um, 
taken on the project of writing a song a day. And that's the same sort of thing. You just, you keep it moving and you make mistakes along the way and you, and, and of course mistakes are learning processes, right? And that keeps your brain moving and keeps your creative energy and your juices up and, and ultimately you get better at it. Yeah. And I think it's interesting as adults, we sort of forget about what it was like when you were a kid and when you're a kid, you didn't know anything. So you're, constantly doing stuff you'd never done before and, you know, playing a game you'd never played before or you're in school and the teacher was asking you to do stuff that you never did before and that was like a daily occurrence. But as adults, we tend to stop doing that and we mm -hmm. seem to want to know everything before we start. And you can't get great art that way. You have to take a chance and, and fail. And very often your failures are a lot more interesting than mm -hmm. planned, um, you know, successes I think can be. Yeah. What do you think, Michael? True. I think you're completely correct. <laughs> uh, <laughs> though the, con the consequences of failure when you're a child are not as dire as when you're well, you that know, is an true. adult. <laughs> and, uh, and that's the there's an interest. I don't have it close to hand, but there's a, a great quote about something like that in the writing sphere by uh, Harold Pinter when he talks about confronting the blank page and all the things that weigh you down and make you second guess yourself and how you have to push through it. Um, so I think it's probably a, a common worry in all art forms mm -hmm. that when do you stop? When do you give over what you're working on? Do you want it perfect and polished or are you willing to, uh, especially something you've put your heart into, are you willing to expose the loose threads that show a bit of how you did it or why you did it? You know, Sometimes mm -hmm. that's exposing more of you. Uh, so I think that's some of the fear of not letting go when you're, you know, wanting to make it perfect. Yeah. Uh, yes, Pinter, the, the man who used the word pause more than anything else. <laughs> really. mm -hmm. Oh, pauses are so important yeah. in, in, and, in and, theater and, especially. And, and it really is the nice thing about songwriting too is that there's no, like, you know, the, the quote that I read was about COVID and, you know, if you if you um, act too quickly with that sort of thing, you could be disastrous from a health perspective or from financial perspective or anything like that. But if you write a crappy song, it ain't going to cost you a thing. <laughs> it's, just gonna, it's not going to hurt that many people. It's not going to hurt anybody. No. <laughs> <laughs> or your pocketbook. So, so write Speaking a of crappy songs, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> coming up in the world of music, on A&E this summer, there's going to be a, a four hour, a two episode, four hour kiss documentary. So certain people can look forward to that. I think and, uh, I've, I wanted to write an, an article about this, about kiss mm -hmm. and how kiss is actually the greatest rock and roll band ever. Mm -hmm. And there's a real reason for it. Cause they're very kiss can, could a band like kiss can never exist again because these guys came out and they're not, they didn't meet in art school. They're not, you know, uh, intellectual guys or blue collar guys who just do rock and roll and they have all this sort of art stuff on top of it, but there's, there's no narrative, you know, they're not referencing the Bauhaus or the Dadaist movements or any of that stuff. It's uh, they're Once you kind of get Kiss, they're really sort of interesting. So I want to write a, an article on that, believe it or not. Yeah, I it. think I think you're. I don't know that they are, have the load bearing capacity to handle all that intellectualizing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's they're, but they're they are fun. They're they're just a business man. They're yeah. I wouldn't saw them live. That, that, that was, was the most was, fun I've ever seen. I've heard. I, that. I would believe yeah. that. I would totally yeah. believe that. But they, they knew what they were doing. Uh, go on. And <laughs> just the uh, the other interesting. Uh, thing I found uh, is the number one Billboard hit is another song by Lil Nas X, uh, mm -hmm. Montero, uh, which the video got everyone very upset because he gives the devil a lap dance. It's it's a very provocative video, but the song is great. And uh, yeah, so he'd, he'd uh, made similar controversy with uh, Old Town Road. Now he's got another number one hit on Billboard mm -hmm. uh, with uh, Montero. So kudos to Lil Nas X. I want controversy what, on our show. Yes, I wonder what the um, what a number one is. Is it different than it was like twenty years ago in terms of numbers? Or um, well, it's yeah, I don't know. How, it's a the, it's still Billboard number one, and you know they've got a number of number ones. Is it the country chart? Is it? I'm not. Sh 
I'm not uh, the Billboard Hot 100, so it's pop. It's just the top pop song right now. Is that still measured? Uh, so yeah, I don't know how they calculate it. Is yeah, it, is it, it on radio factor in plays? Stream? Does streams? It, I mean, because uh, this song is really popular on TikTok. A lot mm. of people are doing things to that. Mm. So I don't know if TikTok use counts towards it, because God knows, no one buys records anymore. No. Kind of sad. No, not <laughs> no one, but uh, not to the same degree. Yeah, and I don't know how how many people listen to terrestrial radio much anymore. Yeah. yeah, and also speaking of documentaries, there's a great documentary coming out soon called "Summer of Soul" uh, about this uh, concert in New York uh, that happened sort of simultaneously with Woodstock. They call it some people call it the Black Woodstock, but it's got all these great artists from the '60s. Uh, there's B.B. King, there's um, Sly and the Family Stone, there's, uh, it's just this fantastic roster of music. And so they shot a documentary of it, but it never got released until this summer, or wow. sooner than that. So awesome. Summer of Soul, I, I, I uh, would suggest you keep an eye out for that. Well, definitely uh, add you know, that what, to the show notes. streaming service that's going to be on? or if it, if I it think it's Hulu, but I'm not sure. Okay. All right. Cool. I have um, a little thing that I want to add is um, I do like to watch things on on YouTube because I watch it through my Apple TV and I like to sit on my couch and, and browse videos. And this video came up um, called Jazz Guitar Comping in the Style of Freddie Green. And Freddie Green is, um, you know, a conic rhythm guitarist in the Count Basie's legendary All-American Rhythm section. And um, this fellow named James uh, Trillo, who I've never heard of before, uh, was talking about jazz guitar comping. So I was interested in that. Interestingly enough, he doesn't actually spend that much time really playing the guitar, but he actually talks about how to choose the notes of your accompaniment depending on on what the bass is doing and the movements of the chords. And it's not terribly long. It's um, about nine minutes long. And um, he speaks about this in a really interesting way. Um, it's all—it's actually more of a, a mental uh, process. And I think if you're, um, so many of us are recording songs at home, and we will be trying to do our own accompaniment. And you know, arranging is a skill in itself. And this can be a really great way of thinking about how you accompany um, your melodies. Or your other music, uh, or your other musical elements. Um, so we will put a, a show note, or we'll put a link in the show notes. Mm -hmm. uh, jazz comping in the style of Freddie Green um, by the Jazz Academy, and it was really, really good. So I wanted to share that with you. Is this is this specifically for guitarists, or can no. a guitar player take something from it as well? Not at all, because I mean, he talks a little bit about the guitar about. Um, about you know like using the two center strings of an arch top guitar because that actually is the loudest um, two strings on a guitar, but mostly it's about where you're putting your notes and you know whether or not you're emphasizing the tonality of the chords. So whether you're, you know, doing the third or the fifth or the seventh of the chord. Um, so it's not really that much about guitar. It's actually more about um, the notes that the accompany um, uh, the the chords of a song. So cool. it's really, yeah, great little, great, great little tune, a uh, mm -hmm. great little video mm -hmm. for those out there. Yeah. Sounds, sounds fascinating. That sounds kind of um, interesting and sort of thought provoking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Speaking really of it. thought provoking, <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, I did want to. Um, well, let's. Um, shall we get into the next bit of the show, yeah. folks? I mean, oh, right. Yeah, the main event. Our main event. All right, we shall get into it um, with our guest, Eric Alper, is a Canadian music correspondent, blogger, radio host, and former director of media relations at E1 Music Canada, of course, based here in Toronto, Ontario. He now runs a music public relations company, That Eric Alper, and is the host of That Eric Alper uh, show on Sirius XM. Before starting his own PR company, he was the director of media relations at E1 Music Canada for 18 years, working with Bob Gildoff, Natalie McMaster, Matt Dusk, Randy Bachman, Ringo Starr, Slash, The Wiggles, Snoop Dogg, and The Smashing Pumpkins, Ray Charles, Sonata Connor, and Sesame Street. Currently... <laughs> He is the music correspondent to CTV, CBC Radio 2, Rogers, Bell, Shaw Communications, 
and so many more. He is also a regular contributor to Sirius XM, TSN Radio, Dog FM in Ottawa, and CJBK in London, Ontario. He's returning to Song Talk Radio to talk about NFTs, or of course the non-fungible tokens. 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 Thanks for being on the show, Eric. Hey, thanks for having me. So good to see you guys. Yeah, yeah good good to y'all see can't you too. be in the same room. Yes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, Welcome, Eric. Yes. So, just what the heck is an NFT? Oh, you don't need to know that. It's okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's Real all we today. And- yeah. Good night, everyone. <laughs> yeah, good night. Um, all right. So NFTs stand for non-fungible tokens. And what they are is that they allow the audience and the fan base to participate in auctions for unique content from the artists and the record labels and the festivals that they love. So they're kind of virtual tokens and the transactions that happen bypass the middlemen or women um, and go directly into the pockets of the artist. So you, you've probably talked a lot about the rights holders of songs where, you know, somebody buys a $20 CD or a dollar song from iTunes or gets 0.0004 cents from Spotify. And all that money is divided up by all the rights holders, the record label, the managers, the producers, people that owe, that get a little piece of, of the share for every single song. Well, this goes directly into the creator's pocket and it happens immediately. So there's no six month waiting for a check to come in. There's no, you know, accounting. It's there. And we've seen this explode in the last, you know, I'm going to say probably two to six months or so where artists around the world are selling this unique content, whether it's concert tickets or um, artwork of album covers or even, you know, rare songs in their catalog that you can now own and do whatever you want to do with it. So what exactly do you get when you buy one of these things? You get a kick in the butt and you get a thank you. No, you, it depends on, on what it is. You know, there, there has been a lot of artwork that has been selling on these auctions and it's not like auctions all the time. Like we know, like eBay, where the artist will set a price of a thousand dollars for the album cover. Sometimes it's like, here are 15 JPEGs of slides from our latest video. And we're going to put them on sale for $500 each. And you essentially get not really a physical item. I mean, a lot of the times it's in the digital space, you're getting a JPEG or a tip file or a GIF of the video. And the, the whole secret and the love of it from an artist's perspective is that there's a very, very limited amount of these that are available anywhere in the world. So you actually get ownership to do what you want to do with this. Um, the big other reason why artists are seemingly loving this is if I bought, let's say, the Kings of Leon album cover and I get a JPEG and I want to sell that to one of my friends, the artist still gets a percentage of those sales mm. forever. So every time that that exchange hands, the artist will still get money for that. So it's unlike if I bought a record from a record store, then five years later, I was sick of it and so selling it to a used record store, the artist would never get that secondary income from me selling it. In this case, they would because it's essentially using cryptocurrency. It can track that sale and who has it forever. But if if I want the cover of the latest Kings of Leon record, I can just do a Google search and download an image. Like what's, why, why would I elect to purchase the NFT version of it if I can just google it and get it i think what it's gearing it towards right now is that the fans are looking for the rare experiences and those ultimate collector items like baseball cards you know um I, did anybody collect baseball cards as a kid or football cards or hockey cards okay. hockey cards it's canada damn it okay so so there's a sport in canada called baseball and no i'm only kidding <laughs> So the cards 
you could have a Mickey Mantle 1952 card that you put in the spokes of your wheel as a kid and it's all damaged and ruined now, but it's still a Mickey Mantle card. And on the value on the free market, it would probably be worth about $7. But if it's perfectly cut and there's no rips, there's no tears, it's encased in glass, perfect mint condition that card can go for about four and a half million dollars right now on the market these Mm -hmm. nfts are a little bit thought of that way so yes you can go grab a jpeg of an artist but to get this directly from the artist that you have paid for um gives you a sense of ownership and pride and ego knowing that you are the only one that owns this version of this and you are special and that's where i start to laugh and not believe that in so much that i get this i can't believe that this is a thing that artists are getting seemingly in the tens of millions of dollars for and it's only beginning how do you guarantee like is there a certificate of rarity i mean what is different uh, of the NFT of the JPEG of the cover of the Kings of Leon album and the one that uh, that Neil has scanned? You know, is it a, is there a better quality? Is there higher resolution? Embedded, uh, yeah, this this actually it? comes with the band Kings of Leon following you around all day, going, "Yep, it's his, it's his." In person, they'll follow you around <laughs> for a couple of million dollars. Um, Inside the actual token, there is a series of numbers, and it's kind of like the version of ones and zeros that we see that we see in music files or MP3 files, or having an ISRC code for the album. But these are very specific numbers that allows this to be tracked along the internet. Seemingly from the outside, there's no difference. If I showed you what the Kings of Leon album cover looks like that I happen to buy for five hundred thousand dollars, and you downloaded the the same thing you wouldn't be able to tell but it's probably why a lot of these things are happening now that are rare things that you can't get or right click and save for instance with mm. the kings of leon for a week before the album came out they were selling the complete album plus a golden ticket for you and three of your friends for life to get front row tickets and a butler and all the food you can eat and all the alcohol you can drink within that show in your town forever. And so the album is almost, it entices people a little bit, but that's almost just a bonus. But what we've seen in the last little bit um, has been, you know, not just album covers and JPEGs, but um, GIF files of, of videos or photos taken from a photo shoot that aren't going to be available to the general public. And that's where Mm. the real creativity has to come in. Cause you're right. You know, what's the difference between this Taylor Swift photo and that Taylor Swift photo, if she decides to sell it for a million dollars, the, the ego of the sale, um, transfix the buyer into knowing that they are owning one of the rare copies of it. I guess it's like, you know, at the end of it all, I was trying to think, you know, growing up, this is so much the opposite of what I would consider music and music consumption. You know, Mm. when bands started in the UK, like the Beatles or the Stones or the Who or the Kinks, their dream was to get to America. You know, they had no, they might as well just say that they're going to the moon. They had no idea how they were even going to attempt to do something like this because they knew that the more people that heard their music, the better off they would be. The more times they got played on the radio, the more record sales they had, the more of a chance that they could actually get to America and back up the truck to the bank and, and be part of history this is almost the opposite this is almost like you are an artist creating this for one specific person and hopes that the buzz surrounding this auction is big enough as if uh you know a million people have your music so it's not the same i mean can you just imagine bob dylan in 1965 writing like a rolling stone or 1966 or and saying you know good song I'm going to sell it to one person. Mm. Like history would be made, but then we've seen this 
even before this with Martin Scarelli, the the pharmaceutical dude. Yeah, the Wu Tang Clan. You know, we, yeah, he bought the Wu Tang album, one album. You know, over a million dollars. We've seen the Beatles' number one stamped copy of the White Album, actually one through five on the White Album that each of the four Beatles owned one copy of, and George Martin owned the other one before it turned to change. They went for hundreds of thousands of dollars. So, mm-hmm. why does having the number two copy of White of the White Album any different or better than owning, you know, a, a double cassette tape? It's not. It's just mm-hmm. in the eye of the beholder. Yeah, that's a really interesting point you make, Eric, because so I've heard that the the quote unquote new way to do music marketing is is isn't necessarily trying to reach, like you say, like a mass audience like they did decades ago, but that you you really zone in on your specific niche and target your mega fans the people that really follow you and that are really excited about your music and, and that are potentially the people who are going to purchase these extra perks that are above and beyond what someone just listening to your stuff on Spotify. Yeah. Um, Look, we're, we're all old enough to, to remember, I think in the early days of the internet, the big, the big score was, and the big idea was that the internet was going to sell a lot of a little, um, or, mm a little of a lot, meaning that in a store like Amazon or um, Indigo or HMV, that they were going to have a hundred thousand different titles on there, but they were going to sell 10 copies of each that that was the long tail. Um, And that quickly didn't happen. That realized that, you know, it's the same 90% that still sells 10%. We see it now on Spotify every single year where it's something like 99.6% of all the songs on Spotify have less than 100 streams. That's an obscene amount of number considering that 170,000 songs are being uploaded each and every day, especially Mm -hmm. on New Music Friday on Spotify. So, There's a lot of people out there who are recording music who other than their close friends and family will not get heard by anybody else. That's what the internet dream was supposed to be. And when I do PR for artists, I always tell them like your audience is out there. You just have to go and find it. It's never been harder because your competition as a new artist are the Beatles and the Stones and the Who, because we're all after the same eyes and ears as everybody else. But at the same time, you play folk music in the style of Wilco and you think that your audience is between 47 years of age and 52 and they're all in Sweden, you can go find them on on, on Facebook for like $15. You mm-hmm. can go and boost the post that way to that specific audience. And that's kind of what you're thinking. And you're absolutely correct. Kings of Leon or other artists like Grimes or whoever it is, aren't really interested in putting this their items up for everybody to have. They're really interested in finding that one person who's willing to pay $500,000 for this. So the, the artists so that you work with... Is this maybe a reaction to Spotify not paying artists, really? Like no. they're just going out everywhere. So now they go, okay, well, we're going to sell something to one or two people that make us a ton of money since selling a record to millions of people via streaming doesn't make us anything. I don't think so. I think what it is, it's it's a reaction to the amount of wealthy people that are willing to part with their money. Um, <laughs> e- even though that that it's not just a playground for the wealthy. There are still a lot of items that could be had for $500 or $1,000. But in the beginning of it all, it was trying to find those people who are willing to spend a lot more money. You know, it's like concert tickets where Beyonce will put her concert tickets on sale or Billy Joel or Ed Sheeran. And the first three rows are $700. The ones behind it, are $250 and up and up and up until you get to the nosebleed section. And then those tickets are 50 bucks. Mm. That's, that's what we're seeing right now with NFTs is if you want to spend that kind of money and you think that you're a fan, well, the artists and the record labels or whoever it is, aren't going to stand in your way to put that money towards the artist anymore. And that's what I find really interesting is, you know, right now, NFTs, to explain it to people is it's difficult. Like it took me weeks to try to figure out, even if you're a band, how to do this. Mm. Um, And then to 
to explain what cryptocurrency is to people and then explain, well, why is anybody going to care? <laughs> That's so difficult compared to, hey, Billy Eilish has a new album out Friday. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's it. Available everywhere. You know, like you honestly, it, it's like, it's like you have to go through hoops to do something. And that's, you know, I, I, other than like, if I want an autographed Bill Collins drums kit, I can go on eBay and find it and pay my money and it's going to get delivered to me rather than, uh, so what, what do you, what, I have to, I have to get a digital folder. I have to put it in here. I, I can't use cash. It's Bitcoin. How do I buy Bitcoin? You know how difficult it is to buy Bitcoin or cash mm. out? It's astounding. Very good. And doesn't it also mean you have to be super famous or popular because no one's going to buy uh, an NFT uh, exclusive album cover of an obscure band? You have to be super yeah. popular for this to work in the first place. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. You know, it, it was it was like when Radiohead gave three days notice back in the day that their In Rainbows album was going to be available on Friday and they announced it on their website on Tuesday and this was back in maybe whatever date it was, 2001, 2002, like way before surprise dates came in. Um, I did so many interviews at that time. And I remember everybody was asking like, so does this open up this kind of opportunity for everybody? It's like, no, if you're still an unknown band with seven fans, nobody's going to care that you're just, you know, dropped your new album an hour <laughs> ago. Um, this is the same token, you know, but you know, there are artists, um, there's Neva and Young and Sick, for instance. They just raised a couple of thousand dollars um, for their NFT. Um, they're in the hip hop world. There's a lot of EDM DJs that are offering um, kind of golden really? tickets for an online concert for mm. $50. So they're just not selling a regular ticket. They're offering it as an NFT because they kind of want to get into the buzz of it all. So you don't have to be you know, the, the Kings of Leon and you don't have to be Snoop Dogg. Um, but it certainly helps. Um, it certainly helps if you have that demand out there. Um, so it comes down to, you know, if you don't have an audience that's willing to, to jump whenever you want to release something, do you even have an opportunity? And I think the answer is not yet. I wanted to ask one thing though, is it's possible for people to, buy the rights to a song. The companies will often buy a rights to the song and then they can license that song to commercials or to other artists and, and make money that way. This is not that. So if you buy an NFT, you don't actually have rights to the intellectual property of the art. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah, there's multiple reports of songwriters and publishers having to chase down revenue um, from these people that are selling these songs because they feel that they should be getting a part of that song mm. as well. But it's not that yet in the very near future though, there will be a couple of people who will actually sell the lifetime forever rights to ownership over that yeah. song. We've seen it already in the physical world, at least in the physical world, as we know it, where um, there are websites that you can go to that, certain songwriters and, and publishers and and producers have sold their small percentage of a hit from years gone by to the highest bidder. Um, it's only going to be a matter of time before I think NFTs start to have something like that, where if you put in $10,000 or you buy that NFT of that one sixteenth of that publishing of that hit song, you will essentially be making money forever as long as the, that song keeps making money. So it's not big yet, but, you know, I have a feeling knowing the music industry and how they like to exploit things, that might be coming down the line. They Is might be it? coming really soon. Though. It almost sounds like you're investing in a stock or something like that. Um, yeah, I, yeah, I, I was you're, wondering, you're like, we're, 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 we're talking mostly about artists. Are, what, what, about, what about the labels? Like, I'm sure they want to get into this space. What are they doing in terms of NFTs, yeah, you know the labels would 
you know, some people might think that this actually automatically cuts out the label because it's bypassing if the artist is actually doing it, but it's actually turning out not to be the case. In fact, Death Row Records, one of the biggest historic hip hop labels, have partnered with um, an NFT company commemorating their 30th anniversary. So they're getting involved with specific artwork and and special mm. B-sides and previously unreleased songs. Um, in the EDM world, there's a, a number of labels, including No Neon Records, that have sold 30 NFTs on Block Party of songs that have never been released before either. So mm. they're actually working with the song publishers and with the artists in order to sell their their rights for it as well. Sometimes they just happen to have the staff, even if it's one person working in their office that understands how to put up something for sale through NFTs, they can actually work on behalf of the artist to do that. So you're exactly right. You know, even though Monster Cat, um, which is a huge indie label and publisher, they've sold 500 NFTs already. They're definitely working in conjunction with the artists and the publishers to make sure that there's nothing, you know, wonky with the, with the legality part of it going over. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because you, you say like like Radiohead could do it, Kings of Leon could do it, because they're uber popular and people are passionate about the art that they create. I don't imagine that's the same. Like, I'm a real big fan of Sony music. Like, that doesn't... <laughs> <laughs> you could do that with Sub Pop, though. Like, I think yeah. that there's a couple of labels in our past where that would be amazing like smithsonian folkways or mm. 4ad or motown or stacks mm. could mm, do it yeah. um and their audiences um without making people feel really old their audiences are ones that have a little bit more disposable income as much mm. you know they can afford the forty thousand dollar boat why not own you know a, a, a four second riff of Kurt Cobain from a concert in Seattle. Um, and I'm sure, I'm sure every single record label in North America and the UK have asked somebody about, Hey, is this something that we're, that we should be thinking about right now? You know? Um, so yeah, it'll be really interesting to see what, you know, if those brand names of the record labels start to come involved with that. With, what is the, what is the infrastructure um, to keeping track of all this, all these ownerships? I mean, is this is this like piggybacking on like Bitcoin or? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, it, it runs it, it. It runs it almost exactly like it is with cryptocurrency and Bitcoin, where um, you know you've got the same tech abilities, you've got the same economic capabilities that blockchain has to offer. Um, so if you're not looking to you know engage with the community and and just put it up there you can absolutely do that um uh, but it runs it in the same way that blockchain did 25 years ago when it first started as it does right now too so it's easily trackable it's easily traceable as long as you know where to look for it in your digital wallet so with, with the artists that you work with eric if there's like a you know a medium artist that's got you know a considerable following not uber big but not starting out either and they come to you and say hey i want to get into this nft space what do you what do you recommend for them um i'd hang up on them oh no <laughs> um there is one band named blue bones who are out of london who are out of london ontario they were um a fairly a, a fairly busy hard rock band in the mid 1990s um they stayed up all night really early on in this um, whole big shebang of the NFT with musicians. It was right after Kings of Leon announced that they were going to do it. Um, one of the guys in the band is a tech savvy guitarist. He stayed up all night. Um, their latest video happened to be an animated video. So they took screenshots of the video and sold it as NFTs. They started it off at $6,000. They did not sell one, but it did bring them a lot of attention early on when mm. people were looking for the Canadian angle of all of this. Mm. Um, and then Our Lady Peace came along the next day and announced that this month or in May, really soon, their next single is going to be available as an NFT first before um, letting the, the general public have at it. So, I, I, you know, there are labels and artists that are, are really making some good money doing this. Um, Foreign Family Collective is an indie electronic label. Um, they've sold 200 NFTs. I probably wouldn't know any of them. 
I wouldn't know who they are. But that's where I think, I think that's where the age of all of us is starting to really surface of that maybe being a little bit out of place because technology and EDM music specifically have always been moving together. Mm. You know, there's always like, the, the, the new instrument, the new computer, the new design, the new technology that's used in EDM is always at the forefront of technology and music, leaving people who just want a vinyl record maybe off just a little bit, you know, in the dust, in the rear view mirror. So there's probably a lot of artists that I think are really, really small or maybe sold a couple of thousand copies or maybe streamed a couple of thousand times, but they just happen to be able to you know get a thousand dollars off of 35 people that are out there hmm yeah it depends who their fan base is to start yeah. with i guess yeah 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 like if i'm steely dan like i'm going after people who own yachts you know i hmm. i'm going after the real if i'm the eagles i am all over this you know hmm. there, there's got to be somebody out there who can afford to skip an alimony payment to one of their three ex-wives while they're working four day shifts as a doctor who would love an autograph JPEG of Don Henley. Yeah. No, yeah. with the, uh, there's no guarantee of quality though. So if you buy, if you buy a, an NFT first single, it's not going to sound any better no. than the next one no. that comes out. Your for the ego. great unwashed. It's, it's just a claim to say that I have this and you don't. Absolutely. You, for you sure. suck and I don't. <laughs> yeah. But but isn't that social media in a nutshell? <laughs> well, that's true. Like yeah. I'm I'm on a beach. You're not. You suck. I'm verified. <laughs> You're not. You suck. You know, look who just followed me. You suck. You know, isn't my life great? I got Pfizer. You got Astra. No, it's <laughs> true. <laughs> Happy right? blood clot. We just we just went through all of it. like that's yeah. that's social media. It's all about fear of missing out and ego beyond belief. Which mm -hmm. of course, people, if they want more information, they can follow me at that Eric Alpha. No, I'm a, I'm a <laughs> <laughs> and they I should. Don't you suck. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. Follow me and I'll be more than happy to tell you that you suck for free. <laughs> for free. You don't even have to buy an NFT, but if you want to, they're $1,500. And I'll take a picture of me giving you the finger. <laughs> but it's a it's a unique one person only one picture person only. Person only. only. That's right. Oh, and Michael Proudfoot just put up his hand. I'm gonna bid. I'm gonna send you the bill for fifteen hundred dollars. <laughs> the bidding has started. <laughs> so and, uh, and when, the when they're selling these NFTs, is anyone selling an NFT of something that's not tangible? Like you know, that's the that, like, who's who's doing something really really weird with this? Like you're talking about concert tickets and a snippet of a video and thing things that musicians think of. Has anyone come up with something that's like really out there? It's not so much that it's out there, but, you know, in the beginning, when when we were first talking about this segment, it was right after BP, the artist, sold his canvas right. online for $60 million. Yeah. And, and I looked at that, and no offense to BP, I'm sure <laughs> whatever a BP is, is wonderful. But the first thing I thought of is um, allegedly, um, and I'm going to say that a couple of times, allegedly, it feels like money laundering to me. <laughs> it feels like somewhere along the line, somebody really ex isn't exchanging. Heads. And in fact, there was a number of stories that came out that allegedly the people that were behind this specific sale was actually the manager of BP. And the person and the, the company mm. that ran this transaction is the manager's own company or one degree of separation away, which means that maybe $60 million didn't really change hands, but it was a great way to get a lot of attention from it. Mm -hmm. And because it's Bitcoin, there's really no way of anybody having any proof. Look, there's no way of, of, of anybody having proof, even if it was an attache case of hundred dollar bills. Um, but the fact that you don't have proof that any of this is really selling in the right place for these amounts is, is pretty wonky to me. Um, but it's also, um, 
it's also a world that is very new to a lot of people. So maybe, but if I'm from the Yugoslavia and I happen to want to, you know, burn a lot of money, well, this, this actually might be a really good business to go into if I want to make a lot of money disappear. And, and, but people have been saying that about Bitcoin forever. Mm -hmm. You know, the, 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 the first batch of people who were involved with Bitcoin have no reason to think otherwise that the people that can afford $65,000 right now for one Bitcoin are the ones that are, it's the easiest way to make tens of millions of dollars disappear over state lines and country lines without having access anywhere except for on a server somewhere so mm -hmm. that's where the that's where i think a little bit of the skepticalism is coming involved at least with the older guard in the media who may not understand what's going on but they might be right because maybe none of it actually makes sense to anybody hmm. it reminds me a bit of uh lithographs and, and printing you know limited edition prints hmm. you get you know that sort of thing where you, you you're creating artwork that has a certificate of rarity you can make maybe 20 copies of this you know online art and only you know those 20 people get it for whatever price you want to charge i get confused with bitcoins because you know how, how does it, how do you track it how do you know it you know, yeah. Confused, I mean, but... with Bitcoin, at least it's in your wallet. But you you brought up a good point, and no knock against eBay. Um, there was a couple of estimates that I read last year that something like seventy five percent of all the autographs on eBay are fake, mm -hmm. and it's mm -hmm. only something like five companies control like. 40% of all of the autograph market on, on eBay. And even if it comes with the certificate of authenticity, who cares? What is that? That is, that's a numbered company from St. Louis, Missouri with a gold stamp on it. That might as well just be a star on your forehead for good work when you were in grade three, <laughs> you know, um, they don't, it, it only means whatever you think you want it to mean, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. just because something happens to be autographed on a baseball or a guitar because it happens to come with a certificate. It doesn't mean anything. So by that token, maybe there's not 25, diff, you know, opportunities to buy this album cover. Maybe there's 10,000 that are out there and nobody's the wiser. And when people yeah. put their, put their, their assets for sale in NFT are they, are they always auctions? Because that can that that can escalate the price too. If you're bidding against somebody else and be like, I really want this, that's gonna raise the price. Like that happens on eBay all the time, right? Yeah, there there's fixed price sales that happen all the okay. time, and it's when an NFT campaign it doesn't have an auction process like that. Okay. It, the price is fixed ahead of time. Buyers can have no say over the final price. Um, as soon as it goes on sale and anybody who wants to buy in can buy it. So there's no minimum and there's no maximum amount of copies that are sold. Oh, okay. Hmm. Oh, so is good. there a place? Oh, to good. So did that change your mind about that Kings of Leon album? <laughs> well, Let's go. Well, are, are we putting well, up money? I mean, if, you're, if you're selling, if you're selling unlimited copies, then doesn't yeah. that take away from the rarity factor of it? Like, yeah, well, the NFT is the thing that's rare. I, I guess so, but but you know, it goes back to the, mm. the the question that somebody was asking before. If you're a huge act like you two, and you can sell four million tickets around the world, and you happen to have five hundred thousand of these JPEGs available, is that rare? Yeah, maybe. Maybe you sell as many as you can for a week and then that's it. Um, mm -hmm. I, and, and again, like this concept isn't really new. Um, there's been limited edition CD singles when yeah. I was growing up that yeah. once they were gone, they were gone. Record Store Day is all about the limited edition, even though mm -hmm. that if they don't sell, seemingly they're back on the record store shelves and in secondhand storage and, and indie record stores a couple of weeks afterwards. Um, I don't know whether or not if that's actually 5,000 copies for this single, I'm just hoping that it is, hmm. you know, but again, hmm. just because somebody happened to put that in, in a number numbered copy or, yeah. you know, I have a couple of, of prints of album covers that were, you know, special edition, one of 5,000, uh, I don't know. Are they? I don't know. I've yet to meet the other uh, nine four thousand nine hundred ninety nine yeah. people. Yeah, yeah. This stuff Online isn't policed by anyone. 
Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and of course, it, it, it is it is a digital thing. So like like it's not like a limited edition CD. Okay, fine, it's a real physical thing. A digital thing. If I buy an NFT, I can make many copies as I want and distribute it all over the place if I feel like. Well, it no, with the, the NFT, right. you can't though. You you can. That's the amazing thing about it is that if oh. Neil if 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 he wants to buy that limited edition song and then sell it to you, Phil, he can. The original artist will still get one percent, two percent, five percent, ten percent, whatever the, the terms right. are of the original sale. So if he sells it for you for five thousand dollars, that artist will still get two percent of that sale forever. And if you decide to sell it to me because I happen to be drunk and stupid one night, then <laughs> that artist will still get one percent, two percent, five percent, however, however much forever. Which is amazing when you think about it, because that's where, that's where for life you will be getting paid for your for your song and mm. it's something that you would never be able to have before if it's people like wanted royalties to... that an actor gets being in a movie you know as long as that movie gets sold and played you'll get mm. royalty checks but this this comes one step further again cuz if you take that dvd and you sell it to you know Bob's video store for $3 right, or a garage sale or something yeah, jack nicholson doesn't get any money for that mm -hmm. you know um <laughs> Whereas this but is for emerging artists, mm -hmm. Eric, yeah. is there any benefit to NFTs at this stage? For emerging artists, for new artists? I think it's fun benefits? to be able to say that you have it. I, I think it's still a really good media angle. I think it's fun for the fans to get involved with it. I think it shows that you're an expert in your field, that you're on the cutting edge of technology. It shows that um, th that they're cool and you suck and and then the rest of them are going back to that. I, I, I think there's something really kitschy about it. Um, but I think at the end of it all right now, I think that they should just be concentrating on, you know, writing the best song possible. Cause mm -hmm. I, I, cause I still think that at the end of it all, no matter how great your publicist is, no matter how good your production is, if you don't have the song, nothing is really going to happen to you. Yeah. If people wanted to um, investigate all this uh, a bit more, is there a is there a website that they go to to sort of see what things are available? Or yeah, I I think the best thing to do is you know it's going to sound really dumb. I I think the best thing that they could do would just Google NFT in music, um, because there's so many articles that are being written each and every day mm -hmm. as the technology gets more honed in as more and more artists get really creative on how they're using NFTs. It's an always constant changing thing. Um, and to grab ideas off of what everybody else seems to be doing and working in order to see if you can bring it back to your own career. Um, you know, not everybody is going to be able to sell front row ticket to their concert for you know sixty thousand dollars but there is something about the golden ticket idea that you can sell as a physical jpeg and use that idea and have your own auction on ebay for you know the 40 or 50 fans that want it start the bidding off at a dollar mm -hmm. and just go have some fun with it so even though that they may not get involved with it from the nft side i think there's some really creative idea that could be had maybe you can't get ten thousand dollars for that album cover and maybe you want to use the idea of that there's only 500, maybe make 500 physical copies and autograph them for the first 500 people who buy it. Maybe you make exclusive artwork with different colors for each of the first hundred people that buy your next physical CD. So there's always ideas that you can take from what's going on in the industry even the technology side and bring it back to the really basics of how can I even get anybody remotely interested in what I'm doing? <laughs> yeah. Mostly just building those relationships between you yeah. and your, and your fan base. Yeah. And that never leaves you. You're always going to have to be, you're always going to have to be guarding with that. You know, Taylor Swift never takes her fans for granted. She gives them exactly what she thinks they expect of her. And if she's still doing that, working really hard on social media for five hours a day, then, you know, there are some people who believe that you should be doing the same thing as an artist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely is um, an, an interesting uh, development, which I certainly never saw coming. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, if you did, you would have told Neil about it. And that's then we true. all would have we all would have cashed in by now. Yeah. 
<laughs> well, and, you know, and unfortunately, just, this episode of Song Talk is going to be available in a limited <laughs> edition. NFT. That's true. <laughs> Let's and capture that JPEG right now. <laughs> screenshot. We're going to have um, an NFT a photo of me hitting uh, Neil in the head with a fish, and it'll be like ten. <laughs> oh, you know, ten thousand. You know, that um, is rare because you have really to be a like herring a stuffed animal. Maybe, maybe we should take a screenshot of this and say if anybody wants a copy of this as JPEG, to email Michael directly. And you be more than happy to send it to through email. Uh, let's, let's start off email. small and work our way yeah, up. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because I don't even know how to do those that cryptocurrency <laughs> stuff yet. Mm-hmm. <laughs> sure you know how to digitally add a fish banging on my head, though? <laughs> oh, that. I can do that. <laughs> Photoshop 101. <laughs> well, that's uh, great. Eric, thanks so much for being here. This Thank is you so much, not- Eric. That was really, really informative. We, we, we've learned nothing. We've learned nothing at all. We're back where we started, but hey, it was fun. It's the story of my life. All we want to know is how can we exploit this for our use? (laughs) Exactly. How does this all affect me, and do I have to show up next week? Do I have to go in the office? I'm just worried that the uh, market for fungible uh, tokens (laughs) now are going to totally fall through the roof. Most people can't even spell fungible. (laughs) Of course, then there's fungible tokens, which are made of mushrooms, but that's going to be a different show. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Next next week, Ellen Musk talks about Dogecoin and, yeah. <laughs> and and how that relates. So thanks for having me, guys. I appreciate that. Yeah, because yeah. that's all the time Pleasure we have to talk to you again. Uh, on Song Talk Radio. Special thanks to Eric Alper for stopping by. Eric, how can listeners get more of you? They can uh, find me on social media at that Eric Alper or visit the website anytime at that Eric Alper.com. Fantastic. Cool Don't forget, uh, folks out there, we want to hear from you. So send us your comments on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram at Song Talk Radio or send us an email at feedback at songtalk.ca. And why not check out the YouTube channel for live performance videos and full episodes now that we're all in these little boxes. And if you're on YouTube, why don't you click on that subscribe button? That makes us very happy. Subscribe today to the Song Talk Radio podcast on your favorite podcast provider, and don't forget to sign up for the free newsletter at the site. You can find the links to all the products and books and web services we mentioned here on Song Talk Radio at the resources page at songtalk.ca and wherever you are in the world. Why don't you join us for the next uh, Song Talk meetup? It's on Zoom. Free to join at meetup.com and free to attend. Great time had by all. And most of all, we'd like to thank you, the home listener. You can follow Neil at neilmodi.com. And how about you, Michael? How can people get more of you? Oh, even more of me? You can't. But you can get some of my photos at uh, Proudfoot420 on Instagram. And you can get more of me at philemory.ca. Stop by the web- website at songtalk.ca to browse past shows and find out how you could be a guest. Stay safe, everyone, and keep on writing. Happy NFTing. <laughs> NFT to the max. This time it's cyber critical <laughs> or something. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah. Well, because it's actually kind of nothing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But then uh, John Cage's, what, 422 is nothing. Yeah. yeah. Although I, I enjoyed the extended uh, dance mix of that. Well, and, and that's what I mean about, like, there's always, at least with musical artists, there always seems to be something tangible tied to it, their concert tickets or their, mm. you know, sneak preview of the album, or there's something you can't hold in your hands necessarily, but it's a digital asset, right? It's something kind of cool to have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, how do you I show it off to your friends, right? How do you demonstrate yeah. that you have something they don't? Yeah. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. And how do you can, prove, you know, yeah. You can post a video about it or something, show it yeah, off I guess so. on your other monitor. Or something. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I was, I was thinking of getting into just Bitcoin just to sort of see how it kind of works. But mm, um, what's that noise? Oh, it's it's that my computer. Me. So oh, okay. it's um, a fairy like, has come to visit you. Is it time to go. You get three <laughs> wishes, <laughs> <laughs> and only only two of them can be dinner. Um, yeah. That. Um, so if you if you put like if you put um like a hundred dollars into Bitcoin, there's I think like a twenty dollar processing fee on each side. Oh, so you actually have to make like a hundred and fifty dollars to make any money on it because mm -hmm. there's it costs money to convert money into Bitcoin mm -hmm. to convert uh, money. So And then there's that guy who had millions and millions in Bitcoins and then forgot his forgot password. His password or something. <laughs> Yeah, and then someone else who died mysteriously, and again, I think he was the largest Bitcoin holder, and no one can get the Bitcoins. Nobody has his password. he didn't leave any information on how to access it. Jeepers. So. Scary stuff. Yeah, bizarre world we're living in these days. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm All going right. back into my cave. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, like, I guess, it, I mean, as soon as, you, as soon as you cut out the banks from the system, if something goes wrong... You yeah, know, the banks ain't there to help you. <laughs> no, not like they usually are. That but is true. Yeah, <laughs> someone else. If some, I want to know who's ripping me off. I, was, <laughs> my, <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I prefer that personal touch. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. No, but like, like if you I lose your, if you lose, hand if, in my pocket. Extensively, if you lose your bank card, you can always show up with some identification and get mm. another one, yes. right? And get back to your wealth go back to your stuff yeah. but right? you can lose a ton of like you know you can have uh you know like a couple of thousand dollars taken out of your account and you mm. can have a hell of a time trying to get it back that's true yeah that, was true that actually happened to me it's, it, oh yeah? yeah yeah it's happened to me too mm. years ago like my, I, someone like uh, who my my ex and i who did not share a bank account she was overdraft on something they reached into my bank oh. to take the money Hmm. Wow! Different, different bank. Like hers was oh. TD. I was BMO, and they st and there was no common uh, bank account between us. And hmm. still, they just went into BMO, and took my money Weird. to pay off her debt. Good lord! What the fuck? So yeah, you just have you can put a face to the people ripping you off, but yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. Only, only very recently had like a fraudulent report or a fraudulent transaction on my credit card. Yeah. And I was like, what, I, I called a credit card. I'm like, I don't, I can't identify this. I don't know what it is. And I tried to trace it down. It seemed to be coming yeah. from a PayPal thing, but there was nothing in my PayPal account. And it was just as And did they help? Thing. They reversed the charge. Oh, that's good. So I don't, I don't know who like ended up paying for that. will not. I remember yeah. putting a deposit on something uh, for a table. And I went, no, nah, I don't want it. You know, like, I'll, I'll eat the deposit. They charged me the full price of the table. Mm. I went back to MasterCard, and I said, like, I didn't authorize this. I go, well, we can't do anything about it. Really? Mine was MasterCard MasterCard will. But mm. MasterCard, you know, and they just did something like that to my son. He signed up for, a, like, a gym membership a year ago. And, of course, the gym closed because of COVID. And they're still taking money out of his account. And he yeah. can't stop them. Yikes. And the bank won't do anything about it. Mm. Wow. That is terrible. So yeah, uh, yeah. Cold, just in case you're world. thinking about getting warm and fuzzy with banks. That's true. <laughs> all right. Uh, all right. So well, good show. Um, I thought. Yeah, it was a great show. Yeah, that was very informative. I'm and gonna write a song there about NFTs. Then we know everything <laughs> there is to know. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I was, some articles on uh, a, a lot of conceptual artists are using NFTs mm. because 
it is just conceptual, really. Mm. And mm. so, uh, and that's the part that, oh, that's kind of fun. The, the non-fun part is the Bitcoins and how do you track it and how do you assess worth? You know, mm -hmm. will it increase in value or is it just determined that that's what it will always be worth? It'll increase forever. in value if someone else is willing to pay more for it after you've purchased it. You would think it. so. Yeah. But, but then what the, are they going to pay? Are they going to pay in Bitcoins? Who knows the value of a Bitcoin? Because that yeah. doesn't stay stable either. No. Yeah. That's uh, like, how do you even process um, like a transaction? Bitcoins because are changing. like a stock. They're not yeah. really a, a currency. Currencies theoretically are tied to something. It used to be tied to gold. Uh, now they're, you know, they're still countries sort of underwrite them, guarantee them, mm. which in itself yeah. is kind of dodgy because you can just, countries can just keep printing money. Yeah. And it only, you know, it only leads to stag, uh, to inflation when you don't have goods to back it up. Like if, if only if everyone else calls in the loans, right? Yeah. Anyway. That's a much larger. It's a whole other. It's a whole and other it doesn't level. help anyone write songs. It no, does not. That's why we're here. That's yeah. true. <laughs> but, uh, I smell my supper cooking. Good. Yes, man. I bet too. you smell your. You wake up and smell the shawarma. Oh, yes. uh, Neil, what's on uh, what's on the menu tonight for you? Uh, we uh, had to run some errands after work, so we got takeout. <laughs> oh, what did you uh, get? What did you get? We got Harvey's. <laughs> Harvey's. We were we were pressed. We had to get back. As I, she, I had uh, Harvey's for lunch. Yeah, Harvey's for lunch. Yeah, we were pressed for time. She had a she had a meeting at six thirty. So we're like, we better grab something fast. We we're driving by. Right. I was like, okay. So, <laughs> I mean, for a burger joint, it's not bad. It's not bad. Actually, they are very good, actually. It's not bad. Did you go for the smoking hot option? No. You get a, you get a cheddar jalapeno cheese, and you get like onion rings, except they're jalapeno rings. Oh, I didn't oh, even wow. see that on the thing. I got hot peppers yeah. on my burger. Yeah, but you can, you can, if you, for a dollar extra, you get the smoking hot option and you get this little spicy cheese and the jalapenos. Okay. So, so now I'll get the NFT version of it next time. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no one else has a hamburger like this. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> My burger. That, that's what Harvey's uh, Markets have it your way, right? Yeah, that's exactly. true. <laughs> have it the only way. <laughs> yeah. All right, hey, gentlemen. Lads. Enjoy your various suppers, and we'll talk again on Thursday. Talk to you then. Take care, right, everyone. Okay. Good night. Bye. Good night.